I got to know Keith as the secretary of an interfaith research group known as CIROS, S-E-I-R-O-S. Uh, in fact, it was an initiative of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints, but has involved people from a very wide range of religious groups, from Buddhists and Baha'i to Hillsong and Baptists. It's been chaired by a bishop of the Anglican Diocese of Sydney. The focus of this group was to examine the positive impact that religious groups have in Australian society and to measure that in economic terms. After years of research, which included a national survey, which was conducted by the Christian Research Association, and analysis by lots of different people, a book has been produced, and that's the subject of the launch today. But I've also come to know Keith as a fellow supervisor, as an expert in various areas of law, including constitutional and commercial law. Keith, i found, is the sort of person who can get very quickly to the heart of an issue and make astute comments about it. But I'll ask Keith now to speak about the book that he's uh, put together. Thank you, Keith. Thank you, Philip. Thank you, CRA. And uh, thank you for the parts in the book that you've written too, Philip. At the end of last semester, I marked a student exam paper in legal history. Uh, the student was responding to a question about the influence of Christianity on contemporary Australian law. Um, the exam question had been provided not expressly to the word but in concept in advance and so the answer was prepared after a fashion. I want to read these paragraphs from the student's answer. Whilst there is still constant discussion, particularly in the political and legal spheres on religious freedoms and protections, I think that's my phone, I didn't put it on, just ignore it. Uh, freedoms and protections, churches, among other religious organisations, benefit from consumer laws that have gone unamended by past lawmakers, parenthesis, like Scott Morrison, who is a Pentecostal Christian. Churches as religious organisations do not necessarily have to pay corporate tax and are often heavily subsidised by the public purse. Churches receive tax exemptions, even if they do not necessarily undertake charitable activities, a requirement for the exemption. Dr. Wallace quoted figures saying that between 1996 and 2000, the sanitarium company would contribute a total of $55 million to the Seventh-day Adventist Church, its owner. This accounted for approximately 65% of the church earnings, but because it is treated as a religious organisation, did not allegedly have to pay corporate tax. There are arguments that tax exemptions for such religious organisations are unconstitutional, as the Commonwealth cannot allow exemptions to advance religion, part of the criteria, whilst also interpreting section 116 of the Constitution as separating church and state. There is also debate as to whether the church should be permitted to not register for GST if their turnover is less than 510,000 annually. There are some benefits brought by Christianity to modern Australian law, including compulsory and universal education, nationalised healthcare and social welfare, which can be found in the doctrines of the Christian faith. These elements of Australian society replicate services provided by, sometimes on a smaller scale, 
not-for-profit Christian organisations like St Vincent de Paul Society and the Red Cross. Now, when I read that exam answer, I could tell that I was a terrible teacher. But I defend myself by saying I checked after I read the exam paper and she was an online student who didn't attend the class very much post-COVID and so forth. I think she had found references to Dr. Max Wallace's book, The Purple Economy, and perhaps read articles that he had written in March and September of 2021. And those articles were respectively called Religion Retains Hold on Australian Politics in Soft Theocracy and Why Australia Needs to Become a Secular Republic. When last I checked, Max was the secretary of the Rationalist Association of New South Wales. For our purposes today, I contrast the negative or that negative and diminutive view of the economic value of religion in Western society with that expressed by Professor Ram Kanan of the University of Pennsylvania and which is replicated as chapter three of the book. And there's a quote, I mean, because Philip and I are here, I haven't quoted us today, but I've chosen Ram. I think this, a couple of things he said are very insightful, to, they remain so. Quote, in most modern democratic societies, religion is largely the force behind performing good deeds and living healthier lifestyles. Even the greatest critics of organised religion would have to admit that all world religions call for avoidance of or strong moderation in the use of alcohol and other mood-altering substances. All world religions call for delaying gratification and the willingness to give to others, a force that is essential in maintaining civil society. Religion is a force for assisting others and the force behind many acts of compassion and care. Professor Kanan then outlined research that had been done to establish connections between religion and quality of life and research that might be done to complete the story. That research included preventing suicide, helping people find employment, job training, crime prevention, supporting prisoners re-entering society, ending alcohol and drug dependence, enhancing health and reducing the cost of illness, caring for the elderly while families work, helping immigrants get naturalisation, helping people find relationships and networks, preventing divorces, ending abusive relationships, teaching pro-social values to children, teaching youth civic behaviour, social services provided by congregations and their contribution to the quality of life of any given society, the nexus between tax paying and religiosity and giving and volunteering. Now, I know when I speak here today that I'm taking coals to Newcastle. All of you have done some of those things through a religious organisation. Some of you have done them privately. We wanted to measure that. That's what the book is about, as Philip has said. Siros originally asked Deloitte to review Professor Kanan's recommendations and suggest what new research Siros might do in Australia and they suggested we begin with measuring the economic impact of giving and volunteering. Now, Philip, among others, has done a lot of work in the social aspects of that. What was new was counting it. Is that a fair statement, Philip? So this, this book documents that story and the findings of that. I wish, it, and I think it is preliminary, we hope we can do more, but it's a start and it's a good start. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Keith. Peter Sherlock is firstly an historian, studying history at the University of Melbourne and the University of Oxford, and his particular focus of research has been the cultural history of Renaissance and Reformation Europe. He's also a theologian and joined the Melbourne College of Divinity as Dean of the United Faculty of Theology 16 years ago. And in 2012, he was appointed as the Foundation Vice-Chancellor of the new University of Divinity. My suspicion is that it hasn't been an easy task trying to bring together diverse colleges, each with their proud independence, their own denominational heritage, their own hopes and ambitions, and weld them into a university. All at a time when the colleges are grappling with an increasingly secular society. Professor Peter Sherlock will be handing the task to a new Vice-Chancellor later in March. But in the meantime, I say congratulations, Peter, on the role that you've performed and thank you for your willingness to launch this book on the economic impact of religion on society. So good afternoon, uh, everyone. It's a privilege uh, to be asked uh, to speak um, about this significant uh, book today. Uh, when I first set out in historical uh, research uh, around ooh, about 30 years ago, um, one of my first jobs was for was to be a research assistant in a project on women woman suffrage as it evolved in English speaking societies. And so we were looking at uh, what became the states of Australia, New Zealand, and four states in the United States of America in the late 19th century. And one of the strangest things I was asked to do was to go and visit the Women's Christian Temperance Union in Adelaide. It's still there, they still run a tea shop because the WCTU were one of the key players and leaders in the achievement of women gaining the vote in South Australia in 1894. Now, I was about 23 at the time and it was a little hard to get my head around uh, why this might be. And I met the most remarkable woman. She was in her late 80s and was still responsible for running the WCTU in South Australia. And she was absolutely passionate about her work. And she said, and I would agree with her now, that alcohol lies at the root of a great deal of family violence and other forms of violence in our society, and therefore temperance is essential. But she also pointed to a long history, going back over 130 years, of advocacy for social change based on her evangelical Christian values. And these advocacy campaigns included being really the first organisation to put its hand up and say, drink driving might be a problem. One of the earliest organisations to say compulsory seatbelt wearing might be a good idea. And these were all ideas that in the mid 20th century were couched as wowserish. Um, but the point I took away from this as a young man, and it stayed with me, is that the influence of religion in our society is at times surprising, at times uh, disconcerting, uh, particularly to the non-believer, but very often has been prophetic. and out there on the vanguard of where wider society and its politics have ended up. So that's my, my, my first thought. And, and again, I, I suppose what I took away from that was that they had track record. They, they had done it. They had actually made some very significant achievements, albeit in a language and a style that was not, if I may say so, popular. The second thought uh, that I, I um, came to mind as I was reading through this this book and thinking about this address uh, was was um, Horn's famous book about Australia, the lucky country, where uh, is so often taken wrongly to mean uh, we've done so well. You know, we're really we've. we've we're amazing people in Australia and therefore we're lucky, as opposed to um, we got there completely by accident through no fault of our own because we may have done all the wrong things economically and socially um, to see the benefits and the relative wealth that Australians enjoy compared to many parts of the world. And I've often thought there is room for someone, so Keith, here's maybe an idea for your next book, uh, to write a book called The Lucky Church. Uh, about how the church itself, uh, Christianity in this country, has in many ways been very fortunate uh, in, in its trajectories and its history until very recently. 
And in many ways, I think the church's bluff has been called in the last 10 years, most notably through the child sexual abuse crisis, uh, but also increasingly through its inability to cut through with the sort of message that the WCTU was promoting over 100 years ago. This book uh, stands in the tradition of a number of recent works that I think have been uh, important and influential. I'm thinking of Greg Sheridan's book, God is Good for You, in making the qualitative case that Australians should pay more attention to the wide range of areas in which Christian ideas, ethos, traditions and activisms have promoted social justice and the common good, the ideal of the common good as opposed to individual gain. I'm thinking of Meredith Lake's uh, book on the Bible in Australia, showing uh, not just as a dogmatic text that has influenced people, the way the Bible has been inculcated through all sorts of areas of Australian culture. Looking to the economic reasons, um, around, around an, an economic rationale around the impact of religion on society in Australia, and a very tightly evidence-based one. And that is a significant contribution, and it's almost unique. Uh, I kind of knew this when I started reading, but it was driven home to me uh, by this book. The book reminds me of a project that we instigated in a body I belonged to as part of my role here at the university called the Council of Deans for Theology. And it's a body that's entrusted with paying attention to the discipline of the theology, theological education and research in Australia to say, how do we ensure its quality? How do we monitor some of the challenges to it? And there have been two critical projects uh, that the council has run over the last decade. One was sort of theological education itself, uh, resulting in um, uh, the book Uncovering Theology, uh, which was similarly powerful to this book in that it was evidence-based. Exactly how many people are studying theology, where are they doing it, in what manner and forms are they doing it, that's given us a basis for change and rethinking where we go from here. The more recent study, far more powerful, was done by Paul Oslington, and similarly to this book, tried to ask the question, what has been the economic impact of theological education on Australian society? And the narrative there would really look, on, look at what is the return on investment on the uh, investment the Australian government makes through the HELP loan scheme, where theological students have taken a loan, what does the nation get back from it? And the answer was actually um, uh, quite a lot. This book goes so much further and so much deeper, and I strongly uh, commend it to you. In many ways, it's a compilation, pulling together a number of essays and a number of case studies completed over the last seven to eight years, uh, and such it's important. I think the choice to focus on volunteering and donations uh, that Deloitte put forward is a really powerful one. Um, first, because it's, it's possible to do, it's quantifiable in terms of dollar amount and impact, um, but also it, it, it touches on an issue that, that Keith pointed to, um, the tax-exempt status of churches. And it surprises people when I tell them that the money I put in the plate on Sunday morning is not tax deductible. Um, I don't receive a gift back for it. But I think it's all the more um, significant to start to study uh, the way that people influenced by religion give and volunteer their time and what that does in our society. I have two caveats um, around, uh, around this book. I think one is that volunteering impacts could go further in looking at the shift that's happened within the churches themselves in the uh, what I suspect anecdotally is the limitation of volunteer time uh, to resource the activities of the churches and their leadership and the extraordinary social good that they do for the benefit of um, common, a common humanity. Uh, and it would be interesting to explore that uh, more deeply. The other one, and this is really my plea to you to please do more, please write the next book, please keep this project going, is to think about what is the interaction between the economic impact of religion on society and, if I may call it, the values-based or the ethical impact. And here I'm thinking of a book that I'm working on at the moment that I hope will be published uh, later this year that's simply called Theology Matters. And uh, what this book is lacking is the evidence base that this book provides, but it tries to bring to the story that qualitative impact. So what we did was uh, myself and a co-author interviewed 11 Australians, uh, ranging from very prominent individuals like a Kevin Rudd or a Stan Grant, um, through to people 
who work in the social services, in education, uh, in advocacy, uh, none of whom work directly for the church, all of whom have studied or engaged with theology uh, at, a, at a fairly deep level, some, some to doctoral standard, others through publications. And the finding of the book was surprising. Um, um, the, the embarrassing thing about that book is it feels like too much of a good news story. These people were really happy and joyful about their experience of studying theology and putting what they had learned to the benefit of wider society. The thing that they brought to the table as a result of their theological work was first and foremost the ability to think outside the box. The theological tools that they had as Christians enabled them to question the dominant narrative, the dominant assumptions and values of the world around them, like neoliberalism or the pursuit of individual wealth for individual or personal family gain, as opposed to how can I transform our society for the benefit of the common good, including the poor and the oppressed and the marginalised. So as I've been finishing that book and as I was reading this one, the question I'm left with is, how do we bring these two ideas together? What is the link between the economic impact and those qualitative drivers uh, that bring uh, Christians in particular, but people of all faiths, into the wider community to pursue the common good? So I want to commend this book for not taking the easy uh, road of saying, or, or almost in a shouty way saying, Christianity is good, faith is good, religion is good and has a positive impact, and taking on that challenge to ask specifically, what does the evidence tell us about the impact of religion on society in Australia? Uh, and secondly, um, I want to encourage you uh, to keep the project going and write the next book and answer that important value. How do, we, how do we find the tools that lead us to do more? How do we pass the torch on to the future in encouraging people of faith, religious bodies and the wider community, um, not just to recognise the economic impact that religion has had on Australian society, uh, but also to embrace how we might continue to make that impact in new ways well into the future. So it's a great privilege uh, for me to launch this book, encourage you to buy it uh, and to read it, to share it and to continue to support the Christian Research Association, Siros, uh, Philip, Keith and others in taking this work forward. Thank you. Mm.